Welcome to Carolyn's Sunday School class. Hi, this is Carolyn here with Carolyn's Bible, Bible class, or Sunday School class. And today it is June 28th, and we're getting ready to have our next study. Last week we took a break from the children of Israel to, to talk about Father's Day, but we're, we're joining them again. Um, we just left them right after the Passover, and they were romping off into the wilderness. And um, so today we catch up with them in the wilderness, and, and we'll be studying what happens when they cross the Red Sea. So let's go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are a sovereign God, that you are all-powerful, and that you love us. I pray that you would direct my words as I teach this class, and I pray that um, the people that are listening will receive from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so first of all, I want us to look at this map. The children of Israel had been living in Egypt in this area um, called Goshen. And when they left, they... they um, the Bible says in Exodus 13, and we're there in 13, um, starting with verse 17, actually. It says, uh, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. So the land of the Philistines is right here, and this is the land of Canaan that's the promised land, this area here. So it would have been really easy for God to just lead them right there. But God, here's the reason. God didn't do it that way because he said, lest perhaps the, cho the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so by way of the Red Sea, um, nobody knows exactly where the crossing is. Um, there is an explorer who's passed away in the recent years, Ron, I can't think of his last name, but he believes that he discovered it somewhere here, that they would have come across the wilderness here, somewhere along here, and they would have crossed over here. Um, in Acts, it talks about Sinai of Arabia, and there's a mountain over here that is likely the Mount Sinai, as opposed to the one that's been traditionally thought of down here. So, um, I, and I believe that that would be the case. So they would have come across and they would have camped out a couple nights, you know, going along and they came down into this area somewhere along in here. All right. And, and God, you remember they had been slaves for at least a hundred years, maybe 200 years. And so do you believe that a slave would have the fortitude and the courage to stand up to war and especially there may have been like borders here between Egypt and these people there would have been guards maybe the Egyptians not letting them cross or the Philistines attacking them it would have been way too much trauma because these people had already been traumatized for years so they would have had a hard time so God led them the long way through the wilderness and so isn't it that amazing the gentleness and the love of God that he led them the long way around because they weren't ready for war. And it also says in, in verse um, 19, it says, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. So back in Genesis 50, uh, when Joseph, at the end of, of that, Joseph told them, when you go back to, when you go to the land, take my bones with you. And so, um, you'll see that um, they're carrying um, Joseph with them when they go. And then, how did God lead them? Did he, you know, obviously Moses was there with them, but let's take our map down. We're done with the map. And for the moment, let's take this, just lay this down. Okay, let's see. It says in verse... Um, 20 it says so they took their journey from Succoth and camped at Etham at the edge of the wilderness and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud well I should have put the cloud up first so they went up by a pillar of cloud 
you can see there it is it was a very bright cloud and I'm sure it was much more fantastic than that and then it says um, and then a pillar of fire by night so they had um, very bright fire and so um, they went both day and night Okay, so there it is. There is the fire by night to give them light. And he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So that is how God led them the whole time. So um, God, God loves them and God loves you too. And though God may not put a pillar of fire in front of us, God loves us and he protects us and he leads us in a way that we can understand, in a way that... Um, will be beneficial to us all right so now we get into chapter 14 and this is the red sea crossing and god yahweh speaks to moses who speaks and tells them him to speak to the people speak to the children of israel that they turn and camp before pi ha between migdal and the sea opposite baal symphon you shall camp before it by the sea for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now, God doesn't waste words. God, uh, um, one author that I listen to sometimes says, says, God doesn't have a word count that he has to meet. So whatever God says, whatever God writes down, whether even though we may think, oh, it's just that, or it's just a place name, or it's just something, but God has a purpose for everything he says and everything he puts in. And so they were told to camp opposite Baals of Fawn, and they were told to camp by the sea. As, as we, um, we're not going to read through all of this because we're going to um, watch it from a, a video clip, but... Um, they were hemmed in. There were mountains on either side of them. The sea was in front of them, and the wilderness was behind them. And but they were opposite Baal Zephon. And the reason um, that God told Moses, Pharaoh's going to come after you. But Pharaoh's going to think, ah, they're they're just lost in the wilderness. They don't know what's going on. They're bewildered. The wilderness is going to close them in. And why is this important? So that another of the gods that was served in northern Egypt was one called Baal Set. So Baal um, is the head god of the, the Canaanites and Set was um, he was an Egyptian god of storms, chaos, the desert and foreigners. And it, it was said in their mythologies that this god Baal Set had defeated Yam who was the god of chaos. And it's interesting that the Hebrew word for sea is yam, that same word that names that God. But because they believe that this, this God set had conquered that sea, then he was the God of the sea. And so they worshipped him. Baal Zephon um, was the mountain that was a ways away, but it was visible from a, uh, from a distance. And it was the place that was named, af that was named after Baal's holy mountain. So here they are, they're camped, and God told them to turn and go there. It wasn't where they were straight away going. God told them specifically this place in front of Baal Savon. And why would this be important? Well, because God is showing this God. And remember we talked about before that the, these gods of the, of the nations, these little G gods, they're, they're not just a little statue. They are backed by... Uh, entities they're backed by powerful entities fallen angels and demons and the so um god is also um going to be speaking to them but anyway so at, at this point we're going to go ahead and pause our video and we're going to watch the watch um, from the ten commandments the crossing of the red sea and then we'll get back and talk to you about it we'll see you on the other side Yeah. 
unto thee, O Lord, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Wow, what a shock for the Egyptians. They didn't, they didn't live to tell about it. Now it shows in the video that Pharaoh sent his army in and he went back we don't know if it's true um, in the scripture. It doesn't specifically say that Pharaoh didn't go into the water. It says all of his armies and everyone in his armies drowned. We don't know if he did. I've always been taught that he did. But as I read carefully, it doesn't say for sure either way. Um, and something that I noticed there, they, had, they were carrying a lot of feeble folk. It says in Psalm 105 verse 37 that there were none feeble among them. And so, um, when we look at movies, videos, they're put out by human beings, and they obviously can't have it exactly the way it was. We know that there were well over a million people. It says 600,000 men. If you double that for women, that makes a million two hundred, and then you've got children. So, um, easily a million and a half to two million people went across there, and I, uh, one of the teachers that I've listened to said the the path that God opened up probably was at least a mile wide. But the, the movie was certainly dramatic and gives us the idea pretty much what did happen. 
And so um, this was something that had never happened before. And the fame of this incident spread throughout the region. So it may be possible that, uh, that Pharaoh did go back and tell about it. And, and in that way, it, the fame spread throughout. But it wasn't just a victory over the Egyptians that day. It was also over the top god of the region, Baal, or how they would pronounce it, Baal. In front of the place that was dedicated to him, and by mastering the sea, which was ba Baal's domain, Yahweh's message, especially to his people. Just a minute. Oops. Got this all up here. God's message to his people is that he was unparalleled. There was no other God like him. None. They might have all these gods that they thought were oh so powerful, but they were none were like him. They were un, he is unchallenged. They may try to challenge him, but it's kind of like an ant challenging you or a cockroach challenging you. You might be a little frightened of it, but you know what? You've got a pretty big foot and you can smash that cockroach like that. And so that is, God is unchallenged. Yahweh is unchallenged. And God is sovereign. He gives us free will. And, and, but he is sovereign overall. So he has the last say. He wanted his people to know that he, I am, is all three of these. He wanted to demonstrate his authority over the rebellious divine entities. The Baal set and all the other fallen realm that, that was shaking their little puny fists in his face. The clear message to them was, your days are numbered. And so we get to the end. They've crossed over. And if you look um, at the end of chapter 14, it says, um, so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So those that had, they had seen the ten plagues in Egypt. They had seen the death of the firstborn. And now they saw God destroy their enemies. God had control over the sea, something that many of them were afraid of. God had control over the wind, over the fire. God had control over all of it. And so they believed the Lord and they began to fear him. And they began to believe him. Okay. Um, I want us to listen to a song. Because when they finally crossed. And it was all said and done. In ver chapter 15 verse 1. It says. Then Moses and the children of Israel. Sang this song to the Lord. And spoke saying. I'm not going to sing it to you. We'll play the little clip. It's just a minute. So um, you'll enjoy that. Sing unto the Lord, for he had triumphed gloriously. The horses roar and groan into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he had triumphed gloriously. The horses roar and groan into the sea. The Lord, my God. And on a prophetic note, um, these verses um, talk about the dread on the Canaanites. If you look at verses 14 to 18, it's not in the song, but it says, uh, verse 16. Well, the people starting 14, the people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab trembling will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, singing this as a worship to God, they will be as still as a stone. Till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. 
You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. And we saw in the, in the video clip how Moses stood up there and he, he said part of this, and he said, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. And so he shall. And just real quickly, when the children of Israel did, they sent spies in, in the book of Joshua, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, one, they talked to a lady there, and the lady said, The dread of you, the fear of you, has been on the whole land ever since God brought you across the Red Sea. And so that was 40 years after this event, and the people had heard about it, and they were frightened. So let's quickly look at the application. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, 1, uh, 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. And we just saw that. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. And, and so we'll, there's more to that, but we haven't gotten to the rest of this part in our story. So... If you remember, we said that Passover was a picture of salvation, that they were set free by the blood that was over their, their doorposts. And that matches up to Jesus dying on the cross and shedding his blood. And when we apply his, that blood, we believe that he did it for me because he was the perfect son of God and he took my sins and gives me his righteousness. And I believe that, that it, that's how we apply his blood to our lives. Then we are now free. And just like they were free of the Egyptians, we are now free from bondage. But we're not free from challenges. We still have to grow in our relationship with God. And so the children of Israel also had to grow. They didn't know very much about him. <clears throat> we learned that they that uh, they found out that he was all-powerful, that no God could stand against him. And they learned all of these things, but they have more to learn. And now the crossing of the Red Sea is like a picture of baptism. We just read that, that they were baptized as they passed through the Red Sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They followed him. They all went through it. And so he became their leader. And just like we are baptized into Christ, he becomes our leader and our savior. Um, the enemies, both spiritual, ba Baal and human, the Egyptians, were cut off from them. The result was that that they feared and believed Yahweh and Moses. Baptism is a sign of the old life being cut away. The enemies are cut off. The enemies of, of the devil, the flesh, it's cut off. And our sin has been crucified with Christ. And then we are raised to new life of following Jesus Christ as Yeshua, our Messiah. We heard that song from Exodus 15 too. And we heard that Yahweh, God, where it said he, because he's referring to God, has become my salvation. Do you know what salvation is? I think this is like really, really cool. Do you know what salvation is in Hebrew? Salvation is Yeshua. So I want you to look at this phrase. Yahweh has become my salvation. Yeshua. Okay, so now you learned a new Hebrew word, but what is the point of that? So, Bapt um, Jesus is our English version of the Hebrew name Yeshua. So, Jesus' name means salvation. So, actually, he was saying that Yahweh has become my Yeshua, my Jesus. So, I want you to understand, and throughout scripture where he talks about that God has become my salvation, it is that same word, Yeshua. So Yahweh is the same person as Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ. Christ is a Greek word for Messiah. So when Christians say, when English Christians say Jesus Christ, they're saying Yeshua Mashiach, that Christ is a Greek word for Messiah. So, um... When we are baptized, then we, are, we identify with Jesus as our salvation. And so let's look quickly at Romans 
I get carried away and I hope I don't get I don't want to go too long but this is really really important Romans 6 says we're starting in verse 1 what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound Certainly not. So people say, oh, well, Jesus took my sins, so I'm forgiven. Now I can go do what I want. But no, he says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should be should walk in newness of life. So when we're born again, that so baptism is a picture of what happen, happens when we're born again. Our sin, our old life, is put on Him on the cross. When we go down under the water in baptism, it's it's a picture of when Jesus was buried. So we're buried with Him, and then when we come up, it's a picture of the resurrection. And Jesus rose from the dead with a new glorified body and we raise up from being saved out of the waters of baptism with new life it is not the baptism that saves us it's a picture of what happened and so when we do that though jesus it's something that we're commanded to do after we're born again and so that shows god and it shows the world yes this i mean it i meant it so the israelites were physically delivered from their enemies who no longer had power over them. When you receive Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, as your Savior, your spirit is delivered from the power of the devil, and you are transformed from the kingdom of darkness into light. I have a couple of verses to read as we close. Take all of my magnetized papers down. And if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, these verses apply to you. If you have not, then this is something for you to think about so that they will apply to you. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. So this is what God was showing the Israelites, that they were his special people. But he was raising them up so he could bring the Messiah into the world to bring us salvation. And now anyone that receives him becomes part of this chosen generation, royal priesthood, and a holy nation. We become his own special people. And why? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We were in the darkness and we were called into his light. Who once were not a people but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. And this is in 1 Peter 2, 2 through 10. It shouldn't be 2 through 10. I think it's 9 and 10. Okay, so we, we are saved to live through him, to be his people by obtaining mercy through Jesus Christ. And I have one more scripture, and with this we're going to close. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, and the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. When you are born again, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are being delivered from the power of darkness. The devil has no more power over you, over you unless you let him. He has no more, you're delivered from that power and you're conveyed into the kingdom of Jesus Christ and the son of his love. And why? Because we have redemption. We have been bought back through the blood of Jesus, and that gives us the forgiveness of sins. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for how you brought your people through. And they, because they saw your power, they feared you and they believed in you. Father, I pray that by, by faith that we will see your power and recognize that you are Lord over all, that you sent Jesus to die on the cross to save us, to take our sins and to give us forgiveness and to give us your righteousness. Father, I pray for those that are listening right now, if they have already done that, then Lord, I pray that you would lead them um, to baptism where they can clarify that yes, I do believe. And yes, I have been um, crucified with Christ and now I am alive with him to new life. And Father, if there are those that are listening that have not yet made this commitment to you. Father, I pray that this 
Lesson today will have made it clearer and that they will want to surrender their lives to you and come to you in repentance and in trust. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time.